on your website, if you're a capital raiser, on your website, you don't just want to have, hey, invest with me, here's a great deal. You want to be educating uh, p prospects, people that come to your website in the, biz the business of real estate. So you're a multifamily guy, all right? So why? That's a rhetorical question. Why do you like multifamily? What are the benefits? What are the pros? What are the cons? What challenges are there? What's the market like today? You know, what mistakes have you made? What mistakes have you learned from? All of that. We're, we're doing, we might be doing well with our website then, Adam. We got a whole wide multifamily page. So Yeah, well, there you go. That's uh, right. Uh, uh, there we go. So that's, but now people read that and they learn about multifamily. But more importantly, what they learn is that you are an expert. Listen, everybody, we all know that real estate is the most proven way to build wealth. But why isn't everyone wealthy from real estate then? It's hard to know where to start. And most of the education out there is just complete trash. And you end up investing your money on a series of courses instead of in real estate. That's not how this podcast works. We give you the blueprint to successful real estate investing and bring on guests actually willing to share their secrets. I started my real estate investing journey as a freshman in college when I bought my first duplex and have been in the trenches doing deals ever since. And today, I now own hundreds of millions of dollars of investment property. On this podcast, you will learn what you actually need to know to be a successful active or passive real estate investor. And we'll offer our takes on what's happening today so you can navigate this market and build wealth. I'm Drew Brenneman, and this is the Brenneman Blueprint. All right, welcome to the Brenneman Blueprint podcast. Really excited for today's episode. I have Adam Gower on the podcast. Welcome, Adam. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here, Drew. Yeah, I listened to Adam uh, a few years ago on the uh, Cashflow Connections podcast with Hunter Thompson, and it was a really interesting conversation that you guys had, and I always remembered it and was able to get in touch with him and get him on the podcast. So I'm uh, yeah, really, really looking forward to today's episode. And Adam's a uh, a 30 year real estate veteran. He's done over a billion and a half dollars of uh, real estate investment in finance, and you know he's pivoted his career and built, and now he's building systems for uh, real estate entrepreneurs, real estate professionals who want to raise money online. So one of the first people I heard who was um, you know really talking a lot about crowdfunding and some of the tools you can build. And, you know, that conversation I heard was a few years ago. So looking forward to diving in, uh, you know, diving in more today. So I guess with that out of the way, Adam, let's just hear how you got going in real estate and then bring us up to current day. Uh, so, yeah, the story is, is quite a long one. You said 30 years, actually m significantly more than 30 years. Uh, I, I don't even like to think about it. it makes me yeah. so old, but uh, I've been in it for a long time. And really, the, the way that I started was uh, pulling wires for an electrician. In 1982 in Southern California, I used to knock on doors and uh, ask people, uh, I'll tell people, I'll do anything for $5 an hour. That's what I said. <laughs> uh, and this electrician said, well, will you do uh, hard labor? So I said, yeah, I said anything for $5 an hour. So that's right. Take the end of this wire and pull it through that attic. So that's what I did. He sent me to <laughs> these ghastly spaces inside buildings to pull wires. And so that's really how I understood or came to learn the business of, of real estate. He was also a general contractor. So I worked as a, a kind of a electrician's, what would you call it, apprentice electrician for a little while on job sites. And I saw all the trades and, uh, you know, how the, the sequence, how sequences need to work when you're actually doing improvements you got to get everything in the right order. And so I really learned kind of getting my hands dirty. Uh, and that's how it all started. And then very quickly, I ended up working for a ground up multifamily shop uh, that uh, needed uh, capital raising. I say, when I think back, oh, I do remember. They wanted me to raise capital from Japanese investors. Uh, so I, I had some good connections with one reason or other with Japanese investors. And so I ended up doing uh, uh, basically an investor relations, had an investor relations role. Uh, but I'm going to spin forwards really quickly because it's a long story. I ended up after the savings and loans crisis of the early 90s, I ended up in Japan uh, and ultimately ran a division of Universal Studios, building all their real estate, Asia Pacific uh, region. 
and then came back, did my own work, and uh, sold out, or did my own development, sold out in 2007, was hired into a bank to help them with non-performing loans, worked for Colony Capital on a $7 billion portfolio of non-performing commercial real estate loans, and uh, spinning forwards very quickly, uh, started doing digital marketing uh, for sponsors shortly after the Jobs Act uh, uh, was passed in 2012. Because I raised so much capital myself. It's always been, throughout my career up until that point, had always been in person. You know, it was, it was kind of the old-fashioned way of doing it. Uh, the, you know, the what we call derogatorily the dog and pony show. Right, you sit in front of a group of investors or you inv and sit in front of an individual uh, and you tell the same story again and again and again and again, right? Um, you know, I even remember, so this shows how old I was or where I am. Uh, I remember putting pitch decks together, or put, not just pitch decks, but that had the whole story by printing out hundreds of pages and then laying them out on a table and walking around the table, putting the next one on top until I had them all like literally walking out and then splicing them together and putting these plastic binders on them. And that's how we did it. I mean, it was just, that's how it was done. Yeah, that's the 80s and 90s. You know. when, the, when digital marketing was permitted by the Jobs Act, essentially general solicitation opened up, uh, and I'm just going to assume you're, uh, your listeners here are uh, knowledgeable, but cut me in if I if I say anything you think might not be. But as soon as the Jobs Act permitted 506C offerings, so general solicitation, meaning that you could do digital marketing and you can uh, advertise, basically, uh, that just eliminates all of that brain damage, really. You only need to make one of those decks, essentially, and put it on your website. Oh my goodness, that doesn't mean put a PDF up on your website. It means your website should be telling your story. You should have articles and videos and your investment thesis and everything that you would normally be presenting to investors. Your entire story is on your website. That's what we do. We build websites like that now for for sponsors, and they're not just websites. They're lead generating machines but that's basically what we do and then when how did you get started in the uh, what was sort of the first thing you built after the jobs act came out so because that's you know a lot of people listening it's they already that was already in place maybe when they started in real estate or it um you know i had been doing real estate for a few years i started in 2005 before the jobs act but then it just kind of slowly it seemed like everything online started building you know um more portals more platforms more places to go, the sponsors doing it direct. So uh, that's an interesting question. Actually. You know where I really started? It's kind of wacky. Uh, I got a PhD. I got a PhD. Oh my goodness. I went from Mr. to Doctor. And I suddenly realized I'm the only guy basic that I can think of in the industry. I mean, almost no one else has a PhD. And, uh, and I thought, oh, well, what can I do with this, right? Other than frame it. <laughs> and put it on the wall. Uh, and so I decided to start a podcast. And the first place I thought to go, now that I'm, you know, a doctor, uh, is uh, professors, real estate professors who have written these incredibly interesting deep dives into vitally important aspects of commercial real estate that no one has ever read. Basically, yeah, you know, they've got like 12. You'd know, ask them how many people have read your paper, and they proudly announce, Oh, maybe I think maybe 12 people have read this thing, you know. <laughs> so I put them on the podcast. But importantly, what I was doing with that, uh, or, or the way that I built the podcast, was I learned how to actually produce a podcast. Now, you've got a podcast, obviously, we're on one. But this was a long time ago, so almost 10 years ago for crying out. It was a long time ago. So I had to figure out what is a podcast, how to distribute it, how to record, how to produce, how to build a website to house it. I mean, it was like really everything. And I I was I like to think of myself in those days as a uh, as a digital troglodyte. 
a troglodyte. <laughs> I knew nothing. In fact, I used to pay companies to scrape the internet of my name. I had the I was of the view that if I haven't told you personally something about me, you shouldn't know. So anything on the internet, I'd say hire a company, get me off the internet, right? Basically. And then, you know, I threw the switch and thought, oh well, that's probably not the best idea in this day and age. And so I built a podcast and a website, and then I suddenly started realizing, and this was after the Jobs Act. So now the Jobs Act is going along, and I'm thinking, well. Now we can actually promote deals online. We can solicit investors online. That's incredible. And I was getting all kinds of inquiries. People were contacting me. I was getting visibility on LinkedIn, on my social platforms. I was becoming known. Crazy. And so one of my old friends from uh, the, uh, the, the global financial crisis uh, days I was talking to him, a multi, major multifamily guy. Then he had 300 million of AUM. Now he's got 2 billion. And uh, so I, he said to me, yeah, we, you know, we were talking. He said, yeah, we're going out for some institutional capital. I said, well, why? Why are you doing that? I mean, now you can raise money from individuals. It's silly to, you can name your own terms. There's like a lot of advantages for going to individual investors. Why are you doing it? I said, I can build a system for you that will attract nurture and convert prospects into being investors because i you know i've i'm kind of doing it for my myself right not to raise money but just to elevate visibility and become recognized as an expert in the industry and he said to me he said well have you ever done it for a sponsor before and i said no <laughs> <laughs> he said well how much yeah, well, i thought him and he said go for it and so that's how i got my first client and so we built, we rebuilt their website. We started creating content and videos. Uh, and like I say, I mean, the, it's the, the end of the story is they now have, how many was three, almost seven times the AUM from 300 million in that period of less than 10 years, probably maybe seven years since we started doing that for them. Nice. And at that time, how were you generating, we'll call it leads, like the traffic coming into your ecosystem? Because it, it seems like a, it's a uh, it's podcast like you need some kind of distribution more than just having it on a platform you need somehow either to be going on other podcasts maybe or pushing it out on social like how are people coming in okay so it's, actually it's an interesting uh question um so this is what i did um i had so the jobs act passed and there were some early adopters right some of the main <clears throat> websites that you see today realty mogul there was peer street ironically no longer uh, and some of the others and so what i thought to do was all right this is a brand new industry this industry of online capital formation uh, has never existed before it's a brand new industry and so i figured well what's the best way to figure out how people are doing it the most efficiently like what are people doing so I started a new podcast. Instead of interviewing professors, I figured, you know, I'm going to interview the people who are leading this industry. Right? This, the, who, are the, who are the startups starting this industry? And I ended up writing a book called The Leaders, Leaders of the Crowd. It's actually published by Palgrave Macmillan, one of the top three publishers in the world. And when I, com when I communicated with them, when I asked these founders, Ben Miller at Fundrise and uh, Jillian Hellman at Realty Mogul and some others. They told me what their challenges were and, and how they were building their companies. And so I started learning very, very early on what were best practices. And best practices in the digital world, actually in life, actually, all come from trial and error, right, Drew? I mean, basically, what they say about Thomas Edison, right, he... he Failed a thousand times, tried a thousand times to create the light bulb and then, you know, succeeded. Yeah. And, uh, he never, he described, and I'm going to utterly paraphrase wrongly, uh, but basically I think he said, I didn't, I never failed. They were all steps towards success. And so when I was talking to these to these, these uh, founders of, platform, of the crowdfunding platforms and other people, I realized that they were exploring all kinds of methodology for driving two types of traffic to their website. One was sponsors, 
right? You believe in us, we can raise money for you. And we're going to go wide online and everyone's scratching their heads thinking this is wild, you know, something, how could this be possible? And I don't trust it, whatever thoughts they had on the one hand and on the other hand, driving investor traffic. So they started telling me all the things that they were trying to get investors, right, to come to them. And so when I started building these systems for clients, I already had a significant head start because I knew what the the leaders of the industry, right, leaders of the crowd were doing and what was working. So that was the foundation upon which we started. And then we started trying different techniques our, ourselves. I'll give you one example. This is from a long time ago that works extremely well today as well in different ways. But uh, Gillian Hellman at uh, Realty Mogul, she, when she started that company, however, about 10 years ago, however long it was ago, um, she went out raising capital. I can tell you this because she actually told me on a recorded call and it's in my book, so I'm not sharing anything secret. It's exactly what she did. Raising capital for a realty mogul, the business, or raising it, capital for deals? Okay, both, just to clarify. Both. Okay. So the business itself was to raise capital for deals on the site, to find out high net worth individuals to invest in deals that were put on the site, right? That was the core business. And that's what everybody listening today wants to do, right? How, you, how do you raise money? So what she did was she went out and what she discovered was when she was raising money to invest in Realty Mogul as an investor, not in the deals, but to say, look, we've got this new fintech platform mm -hmm. that we're building. And this is the thesis. And this is we're finding deals and we're finding okay. what happened. All of the people inside those rooms that she was pitching to invest in the business of Realty Mogul itself, they were all investors. They were all accredited investors. And so they started to invest in the deals. Oh, my goodness. Not a bait and switch, but you're in front of a group of people who not only like the business, but like the deals. So spin forwards however many years, and there are all kinds of other ways of doing the same thing, right? Where you stand in front of an audience and you basically educate them about one thing. But what happens is that they learn you're an expert in an asset or you're an expert in something else. And they so they decide, you know, I'm, I'm also, you know, I, I want to invest with you. That's what you do. I, I don't know. That was a little bit confused, that line of logic. But what I mean by that is in the way that it manifests is that on your website, if you're a capital raiser, on your website, you don't just want to have, hey, invest with me. Here's a great deal. You want to be educating uh, p prospects, people that come to your website in the, biz the business of real estate. So you're a multifamily guy, all right? So why? That's a rhetorical question. Why do you like multifamily? What are the benefits? What are the pros? What are the cons? What challenges are there? What's the market like today? You know, what mistakes have you made? What mistakes have you learned from? All of that. We're, we're doing, we might be doing well with our website then, Adam. We got a whole wide multifamily page. So Yeah, well, there you go. That's that, right. Uh, there we go. So that's. But now people read that and they learn about multifamily. But more importantly, what they learn is that you are an expert. And that establishes, that's how you establish a relationship with somebody. The three pillars of, I mean, they say that it's the three pillars of digital marketing, but really it's the three pillars of marketing of anything at all. You build a relationship of know whether your prospect comes to know, like, and trust you enough, those are the three pillars, no like, and trust, the, um, enough to invest with you. And you can do that instead of walking around a table, putting down different pages and binding them together and FedExing them, crying out loud or whatever we used to do in those days. <laughs> now it's all on your website. So your prospects now can learn that you are an expert and learn from you the uh, all the aspects of commercial real estate investing as though you were teaching them to do it themselves. But what that does is it translates into them understanding you are an expert and they become predisposed to investing with you. They think, you know, I'm, why would I do this now? This guy knows what he's doing. 
I trust him. He shared with me a lot of information that's highly valuable. I'm just going to invest with him. That's how you do it. Very yeah. easily stated. Yeah, and that's, I mean, and I saw you doing the same thing with your business where you give a lot of value out explaining how things work and then people know you're an expert at them and then they, you know, they can uh, become a client or, or take it wherever they want to take it. But that's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure those people in the... Um, those realty mogul pitches were thinking the same thing. Like, yeah, I got, I'm interested in investing in things. And maybe, you know, some of those tech startups are pretty speculative. Speculative. I saw a pitch deck on one of the uh, crowdfunding platforms. And I remember thinking like, these guys need to like double the size of the company for five years in a row to break even. Like I'd rather just invest in uh, real estate. So, and I, so I, so I didn't invest in it. Um, but I could have got in on one of the platforms, but I was like, I just, this seems like if we hit a recession partway through, this seems tough. Um, well, we're seeing the reality of that now, aren't we, Drew? Basically, with uh, with the where the market's going. Uh, yeah, and also the trouble that uh, CrowdStreet got itself into yeah. on the on the one deal. So yeah, that is. Um, but then, so what's the playbook today? So that's what Realty Mogul was doing. But then, what? Let's say you know, I'm I'm a sponsor myself. Obviously, what what would be best practices for me in terms of to reach out and you know. To, or just to, to have more investors come? That's in. a really interesting question, actually. And it is uh, a difficult to answer because best practices, uh, first of all, you need a foundation. You absolutely need a foundation. That means a good lead generating website, lots of educational content that build that relationship, explain what you do, et cetera. We talked about that. A solid social media presence that projects your knowledge and your intel onto social media establishes you as as an authority in the industry. So that's your foundation. But um, how to uh, raise capital at any one time changes over time. And the single most important thing you could be doing today, I'm going to date stamp this. Sorry to do that. Everything we talked about already is, you know, it's evergreen, but uh, but, you know, we're in a wacky world at the moment. Somebody listening in a year's time, right, you, you ought to know when we're talking. It's August 23, 2023. Yep. Uh, and the market is headed into a downturn, slow, kind of slow-moving train wreck uh, downturn. The number one most important thing that you have to be doing today is communicating with your investors. Absolutely the most important thing. If you not are not, communicating what's going on in your world candidly and openly, you will be, your your investors will be worrying about what's going on. You got to talk to them about capital markets, interest rates, uh, insurance costs. Everybody's reading about insurance costs, uh, cost of uh, maintenance, cost of uh, upgrades. How are you managing the world around you as the world changes dramatically from an economic perspective. And you are working on that, right? You're facing challenges. You're struggling with all kinds of aspects of this building, not just finding deals uh, that, that are opportunistic and maybe discounted because of other people's distress, but also managing the portfolio that you have at the moment. So don't be afraid of being open about those discussions and what you're doing and how you're managing it. If you s shut down and go quiet, your investors and your prospects, all they do is worry. They just worry that something's going to go on. And heaven forbid you hit a brick wall and suddenly you've got to stop distributions or have a capital call. To, to, to do a cash-in refi, for example, um, and it comes totally... The first email your investors get is a capital call. That's going to be a really, really tough call for you to to manage that, that um, the, the impact of that. You are better getting ahead of it, talking about this is what's going on, which we're working... You know, we're trying to work to avoid a capital call, we got 12 months before this particular loan hits maturity. Interest rates have gone up. This is how the pro it's affected the pro forma. This is what we're working on to mitigate costs. But 12 months out, we may need a capital call. In fact, we're also thinking of refinancing today 
even if it's at a higher rate, that will require some capital. Why? Because comps are still high. If we wait until next, so we're able to get this much leverage, that's why we need capital. It's less than we had to do the refi, and it's at a higher rate. But if we wait, we are anticipating failed deals to set the new comps. Values will come down. We'll borrow even. We'll be able to borrow even less in six months' time. So we're we're you know we're grabbing this nettle by the hand, whatever, uh, and we're gonna however many what do you call it. Uh, uh, what do you call it? I'm going to mix my metaphors. We're biting the bullet while we grab the nettle. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you're, you're going to resolve. You're going to f finish working through all your problems, you know, early instead of waiting till the last minute. Yeah, that. And but the key is to communicate it through. Just be open with your investors. How do you recommend those communications? What frequency? What method? What are what specifically would you do? So what we're doing with uh, with our clients is we're doing investor update calls. So the investor update calls are, and actually, go, uh, the st stuff we're working on, I probably couldn't talk about uh, openly just yet, but um, approaching other sponsors who have stopped communicating uh, to assist them in making those directly, and personally, to help them make those, uh, to make that communication. The way that we do it, or the way you can do it on your own, is two ways. You could uh, co convene a... Uh, a Zoom call, for example, you could record an update. So a, a live Zoom call where you invite people in uh, and invite them to send you questions, right? What are your questions ahead of this call? You know what those questions are going to be, but it's always good to ask your investors, what are they? And to do a Zoom call, you know, a minimum you want to be communicating once a month. You, you got to be out there at least once a month with updates. Uh, the other thing you could do is you could actually open up a Zoom line and uh, record an update and send a link, right? And that's nice because then you can really edit, you can edit it. And I actually prefer... And investors can watch it on their own time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing you could do is you could do a written update, right? This is what we're working on if you, if you prefer to do that. But you need to be communicating at least once a month uh, on what's going on and talking about different aspects of, of what you're working on. And you never know, look, your network is a network of high net worth individuals, right? Your investors are high net worth. They're well connected. Who the heck knows? Maybe, you know, you want them to help you at the end of the day, or you're going to have to go out and get rescue capital and rescue capital is going to wipe them out. They're going to wipe you out as well, right? You might be, if you're lucky, you'll be left with 5% of your promote if you're in a bad, you know, if you're in a bad situation. Well, yeah, if you're in a bad deal, you're not going to get into your promote. I mean, if your pref's eight, you're probably not making eight or whatever your pref was. But that's, yeah, I think they, well, then for us, just to make it more real then, like, so we send out, we have a newsletter that goes to everybody on our newsletter list um, for the company, not for like me personally, or um, for anyone who's on our company newsletter list, there's one per week. And then at the end of the month, we send one only to people that are on our investor list so it's separate list people who uh you know have gone into the invest now button signed up to be on the investor list and then we send a an update on it depends either what we were doing that month for acquisitions or really it's what the most important updates uh for the company i'd say that the investors want to hear about so a couple months ago was about what are we doing with the banking crisis then the next one's what are we doing in these specific markets we're looking for new deals um and then that's that's once a month, but it's not like per deal. It's just more general on what we're doing. And then we do quarterly reporting. So you get your quarterly statement on the on the deal you invested in. Um, do you think that's that's the right amount or we should be really sending out a monthly thing for each property? No, no, no. You, you're nailing it. And you know what you could also do as well, Drew, is uh, send out a survey. All right. I mean, don't, don't ask me. The only people, I mean... You are asking me, but well, a lot of the people they don't respond. You ask them, and they're they're trying to be they're passive investors. They're not trying to fill out. But you can, what I've found, uh, you know, surveys and stuff. I'm not. I don't get much of a response. I get. Um, have you seen you know, a lot? A lot of. Have you sent out a survey? Uh, we 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 did uh, a while ago, but it was for the podcast content. It wasn't for LPs, but we um, 
But but continue. So I mean, yeah, so some people did, are yeah. different than me. Yeah. So we did it, and I'm happy to share it with you as well. If you want, just email me afterwards. Uh, but we did a, a multi-sponsor investor sentiment survey at the end of last year. Uh, we sent out to uh, yeah, gazillion accredited investors. And you make the survey as easy as possible with multiple choice. Don't guess. I mean, yeah. actually, I did that very... Te- I was very scientific. I first did focus groups with, with small groups of six or seven investors. I think I did three of those to find out what language they were using and what their concerns and thoughts were about the market. And from that, wrote the survey. Uh, and every single survey question had a practical... Uh, the answers w- were um, actionable. So don't ask, you know, interesting questions. Ask something that has an actionable response. So, for example, how often do you want to hear from your sponsor was one of the questions. And it was a multiple choice, right? So I had a multiple choice, and the answer was at least once a month. That is an actionable result from a survey. So we know that. Um it, so you could ask your you and do a live. You know what the other thing you could do once so I'll do a live a live call, like a live Zoom, like open open mic. Or ask me anything, and don't be afraid of it. Look, if if you are high integrity and you're working hard at what you're doing, you, no one's going to get you a gotcha because they they're going to ask you. They might ask hard questions, and you're going to answer honestly. What what I another way you can do it is uh, so with our clients. What I've been doing is uh, MCing those calls so we'll convene a, a meeting like a zoom call not a webinar it's a, a kind of a, a an investor update and then i actually i just talk to them I, you know what's going on i know what's going on so I ask, right. I ask all you know i ask them I, you know people they will t- my our clients talk to me very openly about what's going on and i know they're working hard to um to navigate and to get ahead of the curve and actually take advantage of the circumstances so um i mc the calls and i q a it and people like that investors like that if you've got a good rapport with somebody even one of your partners drew you could have a you know just a, a back and forth i also do this friday call with uh actually with uh, uh you know with a with a guest every friday that we've started doing live and we just talk about that week's main news headlines. And so it's really a back and forth. And you could do something like that as well. And if you've got people joining a Zoom call, almost I think of it like open office hours. Uh, we do a yeah. office hours, join us for an open. Then it's, it's not a webinar. It's not a pitch. You know, it's open office. It's like everyone's around the, around the country. Come join us. We have open office on Friday at noon. Don't do that because that's when I do my live thing. Uh, fr- Friday at one o'clock. Do do, do new and edit. Yeah, new and at a different time zone. I just say and just say, yeah. Look, we're doing open office. Come and join us, right? And that's all you need to do, and and talk about what you're seeing. Chat with one of your colleagues, and if somebody joins you, make sure to ask them questions. What are you seeing? What are your concerns? And what questions do you have? People like to engage. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And we did. Uh, um. Yeah, we we did. I did a podcast where I was. Uh, we did this as a Twitter Spaces or something live, and then people were on and were ready to ask questions. I was surprised. Whereas, uh, um, made it to the whole to the end of the whole thing. So I mean, yeah, it would be similar idea where people were waiting around to ask us stuff, and you know, and those are aren't even our investors. And so yeah, that's um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think the two we just want to when you're going through the steps of the system, you know, number one was having the the website right. And getting traffic to it, but how how are you advising people to get traffic to their website? Because just because you have a website doesn't mean anybody's going to go to it. So aside from technical ways of getting people to your website, like search engine optimization, SEO, uh, you want to be posting on social media regularly, and you don't need to be doing it manually. You can automate posting on social media. Uh, so if you automate your posting on social media, the best way to really figure that is just go to my my uh, profile on LinkedIn because there's I post, I don't know, three, four times a day. I used to post 10, 12 times a day, but then the world changed and I've kind of shifted to, I don't want to be tone deaf. I basically, to people's concerns. So we've revamped all the content. So I'm only posting four times a day or so. 
But you'll see every single post is branded. It's all automated. It's branded, so the same logo, color, that's what you should do. Logo, color, and font. Uh, we put little quotes up, and then every single post has a call to action, a link. That's really important. You must have a link so that somebody who sees a particular post and thinks, that's interesting, I'd like to know more about that, has some way to access that something else. So that's why you put a call to action, a CTA, a link. And so, for example, to your podcasts uh, or to articles or whatever you've got, right? Or articles on your website. So um, then what happens? As soon as somebody sees that and clicks on one or pauses or reads the whole of one thing you've got on LinkedIn, it's all automated. What happens? LinkedIn will now send them. Every time they log on, you will show up in their feed, right? It's like, okay, we'll just give you more of this guy. And then if you post manually as well, now that's the optimal format. So you've got automated posts and then you post manually commenting on other people's things or liking or whatever you, you, know, you might do. Engaging. Engaging. Now you actually start to really fill out your profile. As long as the posts that you initiate have a call to action, uh, that's how you create a funnel. Because now you allow, every single time you communicate with somebody, and that inc also includes in emails, by the way. So if you're sending out your uh, your your weekly reports or something, or your quarterly reports, you must have a link that says here, you know, whatever you want, book a call, or um, read this article, watch this video. Always encourage people, give people the opportunity to take another step. This is the idea of the funnel, right? The more steps people get, the closer they're going to get to actually investing with you. So make sure that that uh, your communication is, um, I want to say greased. I'm not sure if that's the right term, but is- I mean, it's moving people down a step. A lot what you're saying. Yes, give them, don't like make them look up your website. Okay, that's interesting. I got to look and put a link in there so that they can click and, and get there straight away. That makes a lot of sense. And when you say an automate, you're you're referring to like a scheduling tool, yeah. like a Sprout or Hootsuite. We use uh, Sendable. We uh, actually test all platforms once every couple of years because none of them are perfect. All the yeah, uh, and we and we you know there's things that we have gripes about, so we we look at all the platforms and see have they have they solved this gripe, and usually they don't. Uh, so we use Sendable, but yeah, basically a scheduling uh, tool. Unsendable, have you had any, uh, how far in advance are you scheduling like video clips? Cause I'm using Sprout and I've, we've had a thing where if it's more than maybe a few weeks out, it, it, uh, it doesn't, it, it fails to post, like it loses the video. I don't know how long in advance for as long as the internet is up. Uh, and the way that it works on Sendable that's really cool is that you build your, they're called queues. This is really into the weeds, but I'll do, so I'll do it quickly. But you upload all the content. So we, what we do for our clients and for Gower Crowd, this is what you'll see if you go to my LinkedIn profile, is we create tons of content on the website and on landing pages and wherever it is, right? All kinds of funnels. Uh, and then we fragment that content. So we take sound bites. It might just be a, a quote. Actually, I call them notable quotables. We take a notable quotable. We create a, 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 an image for it. Uh, and uh, we put that into the automated tool with a little message and a CTA. So if you like what you read, now you can travel to see something else. Now in Sendable, you keep uploading as you create those, more and more and more of them. So at one time I had 4,000, believe it or not, 4,000 of these things. And uh, you put them into a queue. You want to be posting uh, on a six-month cycle. So you post on a six-month cycle and with Sendable, what's nice is when it exhausts the list after six months, you can say, start again. And it will just start again. Yeah, that's very nice because it's the way it seems like it's working in Sprout is it's just like a one-off post. It goes out and now it's just sort of done with it. It has the same queue some function you're talking about where, you know, you pick your time slots per day. But yeah, like I said, I feel like it was losing the video files. You got too far out. And obviously if Sendable can reuse six months later it's not yeah just it goes through so if, 
So the way that it works is, again, this is kind of pro tip. It's a bit into the weeds, but anyone listening, it's basically with this, what we do, we build these things for ourselves and for clients. But basically- Well, yeah, we want, I think you got, we get people, you know, this is like what you were saying for the real estate sponsors. You show your expertise and people all come to you, Adam. So we got you know, to, go yeah. <laughs> So I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning. Maybe I need to switch the sound of this. Thing. So, uh, but yeah. uh, basically, so if you think this is how we, this, look, this works. Oh, well, that's all I can say. It works. And the way that we do it is six months. That's 26 weeks, five days, five weekdays uh, a week, obviously 120, whatever, 120, approximately 125, uh, postable days every six months. So if you've got 125 posts, notable quotables, right, that you've banked, that's one post a day, and then it resets. Now, when you get up to 250 posts, you don't go out for 12 months, you post twice a day, so at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So you put, now you've got 250 posts in the queue, but they're posting twice a day, so the queue is going to expire after six months, and you just set it to restart. The other thing that's nice about Sendable is there's a button there that says shuffle. OMG. That is amazing. Because now what you do is you take the same cue, you just copy and paste it from you to your partner, uh, to all of your C-suite execs, and they all go in, you set times for them, and you hit shuffle. And what that means is nobody is posting the same thing (laughs) at the same time on any day. So somebody researching your company goes to you and then they go to your your partners and they look at their feeds and it's all different. It's like taking your website and breaking down all the content. I like to think of it like playing card, like a deck of cards, like just getting a little one card with a little statement on it and picking, you know, from all over your website, all thousands of different comments and just shuffling it and handing out those cards on a regular basis. That's basically what you're doing. It works like magic. The biggest complaint, actually one of the only complaints uh, that we get from clients when we set these things up and hit go is I'm getting too many requests to connect. Yeah. It's like, can you like slow that down? So we switch them to follow, not connect. So that way. Oh yeah. Okay. Like on LinkedIn. Yeah. 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 LinkedIn. Yeah, and you're getting too many crazy DMs on there too. Suddenly you start getting, yeah, so. this, I mean, you are elevated. And somebody who does research for you, when they look you up nine times out of 10, when they run your name, the first hit is LinkedIn. So you got to have a good profile. It's like, and it's free. Oh, it's free. Like number one hit on Google search for your name is going to be LinkedIn. Milk it. <laughs> Basically, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and then what, and so then this is all in the name of driving traffic to your website. And then, and what, what is the, the type of content people will put out? So you have the quotes, that's a, just an image with a quote, the notable quotables. Yeah. That's just an image with a, with a quote on it. Where would the quotes come from? Like, obviously for me, I have a podcast, so we have just hours and hours of stuff, but for someone else though, they, they don't have a podcast. Where would the quotes come from? So let's say you've got an article that talks about uh, the different kinds of multi, different kinds of what is multifamily, right? So you've got garden, walk-ups, yeah, whatever, all the different varieties. So you put an article there on your website and you explain the kind of multifamily that you are particularly interested in and you, you go into detail in that. So what you do then is you go through that article and you take quotes from the article, just single lines. You can modify them slightly, create a, an image just with that, even with quotation marks on it, that's branded. So it's got your colors, font, and logo. And that is a post and the link to that, to that image. And then you have a little language that says, if you want to learn more about multifamily, click here. And that link takes prospects to the article that you extracted the notable quotable from so we'll do for any so for any article we'll create upwards of 20 notable quotables for example but i also if you've got a white paper you could do 20 notable quotables for a white paper and you got a landing page that's lead gen download the, the white paper give me a name and email address 
And as soon as somebody puts in their name and email address, what happens? They start getting automated emails from a sequence of welcome email. First thing is the white paper. Second is learn more of whatever. There's a, there's some optimal yep. emails that you put out. Those are all automated. And then once you've gone through that automated sequence of welcome emails, boom, what happens? They're on your newsletter. So now they're hearing from you regularly. And that's that's how you scale, basically. It's how you scale. And all that's just images with written content. So that's not, yeah, this where it's not, uh, you don't need to be like a, YouTuber or, you know, Instagram influencer or something no, to do this. No, no, So uh, yeah. Are you, no. <laughs> for those listening, Adam's making a face right now. No, <laughs> but yeah, that is, um, and then, and so what platform, I mean, this is really primarily LinkedIn then, uh, or what are you? Yeah. So we, so we track also, we, we analyze traffic extensively. So, uh, the, the channels that we prefer are LinkedIn, Twitter, or whatever it's called these days, LinkedIn, Twitter, X, Facebook. Yeah. LinkedIn, if you are not active, uh, actively posting, uh, LinkedIn is by far the most, you're going to get the most traffic from LinkedIn. Uh, what we've found is that cl some clients like to use Twitter a lot. Uh, and so they will get most traffic from from Twitter. So most of them, we read this using Google Analytics and Google tells you what, where all your traffic is coming from. It's very detailed. The amount of data drew that's out there is blow your mind. But if you if you are passive, uh, LinkedIn, then Facebook, and then Twitter. Those are the in that order, those are the three top ones. Twitter, a very, very distant third, unless you are active on Twitter. However, when it comes to advertising, paid advertising, unfortunately, Facebook is by far the least expensive and most effective when it comes to paid advertising. Now, that's the point. Once you've got your mousetrap right in place, that's your website with its content, lead generation forms all over the place. Right? You've got to have lead gen forms on every page and a solid auto-posting social media presence then you can move to active marketing. This was actually your first question. How do you drive traffic? Well, you got to do active marketing. Podca get on podcasts, great thing to do. Uh, you can do paid advertising. You can get PR, right? Get mentioned in the press. Uh, you could do, uh, you can do webinars. Uh, one thing you should never, ever do, you know, they have these things. The one thing you should never do this is the one thing you should never know. Click here to find out. Give me your name and email address. Well, I'm going to tell you without even giving me your name and address. Never, ever buy a list and blast emails. Never do that. You will end up labeled a spammer by the spam police. Uh, your open rates will drop to sub 10% and you won't get emails through to your partners. Your investors won't get emails. So that is the one thing you should never do. It's so tempting and seductive to buy a list of what? I don't know, family office names or uh, accredited investors or whatever. I'll buy 100,000 names and boom, send out one email. It'll be the last email you'll see. You'll, you'll just go down to zero in open rates and kill your business. So don't do that. But there are all kinds of ways of navigating it better. That's yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, even on our newsletter list where we never bought any uh, contacts where we've if someone hasn't opened it and opened an email in a long time or we'll take them off. So here's another you want to like a super high value uh, pro tip is another one. Now that you've said that, don't take them off. People will naturally unsubscribe when when they're done with you. But here's what we discovered works exceptionally well. So my open rates now sometimes hit 70%, like crazy high open rates. And the way to do it is like this. So what you just described was cold emails. That's somebody who hasn't opened for, and you can define the period of time, say 90 days, but you've also got to be emailing regularly to get this data. That's another reason you need to be emailed. So let's call it 90 days. If they haven't opened for 90 days, they are a cold subscriber. And that's not good. You want to have high open rates 
because then the spam police figure the spam police are tech tech companies that are monitoring the internet yep. for this. Uh, but th with high open rate, <clears throat> they know that your emails are being positively received. So having those cold subscribers is not good. So here's what you should do. Email your warm list every single time and your cold list once every four emails. Just once. Okay, every interesting. Because you want to keep them engaged. You do still want to email them. Uh, and that is how we've seen open rates go up to 70% for the warm list. And then for the cold list, when you include the cold list, it'll drop to 35 to 40%. But you're still giving them an opportunity to open your email. Uh, there was something else I was going to say, also very technical about how to do that. Oh, the other thing you can do is a cold email list re-engagement campaign. So you might want to con consider doing that, say, once every six months where you send out a, a, a sequence of three emails only to your cold list saying, noticed you've not opened an email for a while. If you want to stay on the list, click this link. If you want us to remove you, click this link and you won't hear from us again. And you send out a sequence of three of those over seven days. And that's a cold email re-engagement campaign. Yeah, I've been on a few of those. So yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, collect them. Well, well, Drew, just yeah. Collect those. Copy the language and see yeah. your list. Yeah. And then, and so one thing too. So then, just kind of going down the the chain of what people should be doing. So if you put a link in a post on LinkedIn and you're linking off the platform, I thought that drives the engagement of it down. That's why people put their links in the comments. Uh, and others. Yeah. I, you know. What's What's your experience? Yes. This is a a trade off in time. So I don't spend, I simply don't have time to be posting on LinkedIn. I like to comment sometimes, but I don't have time to be thinking, all right, I need to, you can only auto post the post itself. You cannot right. auto post a comment. So if you're auto posting and then putting a link in the comment, by all means. However, if it's you that is posting the link in the comments, it makes doesn't make any difference at all. It's you that's doing it. You want somebody, you want other people to post in order to drive engagement. But at the end of the day, you've got to decide how much time do I want to spend on LinkedIn? Uh, Yona Weiss, bright guy. Everybody knows Yona, right? Right. And and he's the, the cost set guy. And I've talked to him a few times. How does he get the engagement he gets? And in one of my podcasts with him, if you don't have him on, you should ask him because he knows this stuff. But ask him this also. I said to him, well, I, I, so you got this amazing engagement, huge response. People always respond. They like, they comment, and et cetera. Like, How much time do you spend on LinkedIn a day? He said, between six and seven hours. What? Six and seven hours a day. A day? I asked him, how much time do you spend on Twitter? He said, not quite as much as LinkedIn, but I get great response over those ones. So the, it's up to you. How much time do you want to spend? Yeah, there's all kinds of ways of playing the algorithm. If you want to become a mega superstar on LinkedIn, it is going to take time. The only, And why? Because they want you to pay for that. You can get all that engagement and visibility by paying to advertise, right? Facebook does that. They all do that. So the only way to really get it up is to be hyper engaged and to be manually doing it. The way to think about LinkedIn, though, is it's an extension of your website. That's all it is. Whatever happens when somebody runs your name, LinkedIn is going to be the first link that shows up in Google search. So somebody's going to click on that. So give that prospect everything you can. It doesn't matter if there's no engagement. They're going to go to your profile. They're going to look at your profile. They're going to click on your post. And what are they going to see? All kinds of replications, essentially, of the content on your website. All these high-value, interesting comments and quotes on your website. And one thing they'll see and think, oh, that's interesting. Click. And they end up on your website. And they've now established, started to develop a relationship with you slowly. Oh, and by the way, before somebody will engage with you, you need to, they need to see you.
between eight and 12 times. So you have to be visible in their world between eight and 12 touch points. That could be paid advertising, LinkedIn, Facebook, podcasts, you know, uh, in the news, wherever it is, before they will actually engage with you. So I, that's how we work with LinkedIn. Is It's just all it is, is a, uh, a manifestation of your website and your intelligence all put onto LinkedIn so that people can research you quickly. And if you want to get okay. into engagement, yeah. figure you got to now... St- but who cares about chit-chatting on, on social media? It doesn't matter. It's not the point. The point is you elevate your visibility and are recognized as an authority just because you are pinned. Yeah, and then you're you're automating it where you're scheduling things. You can reshuffle the content. I mean, that... Yeah, makes a lot of sense. How are you? Um, uh, and then if someone does this on Facebook, they need to make the, their a new profile as a page, or, or how? Um, you know what I'm asking? Because like there's different there's pages and then there's people, but to um, have people just join without friend requesting you or to follow somebody, they need it needs to be a page, right? I just have a. I think I have a company. Honestly, I set this up so long ago, and I bet I only use my personal profile on Facebook is shut down to everybody. I have very few, you know, quote, Facebook right. friends. I just use it to look at ads. I'd like to try and look at Okay. Ads. And I also join kind of joke groups because I, I occasionally need a laugh. Uh, so I like going through memes. Uh, so you need a company page on Facebook and then just post to that. Again, all you're doing is making, all you're doing is to make it easy for your prospects to find you wherever your prospects are. That's all you're doing. You're just being everywhere in front of everyone all the time. That's all you're doing is just being visible so that a prospect who likes Twitter or who likes Facebook, who likes LinkedIn, they're going to find you wherever you are. And the nice thing about auto posting is you can be everywhere all the time. Take that same cue, right, we talked about, and you post the same thing to Facebook, the same thing to Twitter and Instagram, if you want, at, at all the platforms that you want. It's all automated. That way, somebody who researches you will find you where they want to find you. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And for each platform, so let's say we talked about LinkedIn, you're saying you're posting those posts personally, uh, like with the scheduler, what profiles are coming from? Your personal profile or the company one? On LinkedIn, both? personal and company on facebook company twitter personal uh instagram no idea i don't pay much attention to instagram yeah i mean if yeah if you have video content you know uh youtube shorts instagram tiktok like they're they push content out if it's under a minute with with the reels or shorts depending on what the platform name is so if you have a lot of video those are good um because i have videos from the podcast and we load them into sprout and you just check the boxes for what platform you want to put on. So we put it on all of them. Like I have a, I have a TikTok account, Adam, but I don't even know how to use TikTok. You know, we just push it to it. It's just another button to click and, uh, and you got 2000 followers absolutely. on that, you know? Bet so there's people there. Something is better than nothing. You never know. And it, but you need video to do well on the, on those platforms because it, it needs to be suggested. Well, everyone's looking in the reels section or the video section. So like just if you're posting the, pictures you're not going to get much discovery on instagram whereas yeah on linkedin or these other platforms that's what people are looking at so well cool well let's let's leave it there i think if you if people want to find out more or they want to get just get started with some with with your system and where do they go so the best way to reach me is to go to gowercrowd.com that's my website g-o-g-o-w-e-r crowd.com and subscribe to our newsletter we send one out every Wednesday, there's no charge for it, uh, and it covers all the latest news in uh, commercial real estate, syndication, and crowdfunding, and we're focused actually at the moment on distress, what's going on in the market, how to overcome the challenges, and take advantage of the discounts that we're starting to see and we'll continue to see over the next few months at gowercrowd.com, all that. Perfect. And then, so if someone wanted, if they're a sponsor and they want to sign up with you, I mean, best ways to get on the newsletter than the... And you'll get an email from me on a Wednesday and you can reply to it. Or if you really want, you can just email me at adam at gowercrowd.com. You're welcome. To do that. There, there we go. Yeah. I mean, no, this is, yeah, this is great info. 
I, I appreciate and the other some things that you were talking about that I'm already doing, but then a lot that I'm not, um, where it seems like using sendable would be a smarter move for me. Cause then the content would be sitting there instead of, we would have to then go do it all over again next year and sprout. So, and, you, and, and if you keep so. adding to it, you just add the frequency each day and you get more and more variety. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah. Thanks Adam. Appreciate it. This is a great episode. <laughs> really interesting questions. Yeah. We really dive, dove deep, dived deep or whatever. Yeah, it's good. a pleasure being here. Thanks, Drew. If you learned something from today's show, leave a review and hit that subscribe button wherever you enjoy your podcast. Dive deeper into real estate investing on Brenneman Capital's website, brenneman.com, where we have numerous free resources and information that can help both active and passive real estate investors. Accredited investors can get started today as a passive investor in our multifamily investment opportunities by hitting the Invest Now button on our website. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Drew Brenneman and guests as of the date of recording and do not purport to reflect the views or opinions of Brenneman Capital LLC and its subsidiaries. Views and opinions are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon or deemed as investment or tax advice or an offer to buy or sell securities. The speaker cannot be held responsible for any direct or incidental loss incurred by applying any of the information offered.